my name is Autumn Dixon, and this week is October 16th through the 22nd of the Come Follow Me program associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we are studying the New Testament in 2023. Now, for this particular week in Come Follow Me, Paul has written to the Thessalonians. Now, this is a group of saints that had been highly persecuted, but had remained very faithful to what they had been taught by Paul. And Paul was absolutely overjoyed with their faith. And he speaks a lot about that in their letters. But there's one little tidbit of, it's just one little phrase. (laughs) And he doesn't elaborate on it a ton. But there's this one little phrase that he kind of just says in passing in the beginning of his first letter to the Thessalonians that I want to actually focus on today. So this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and it is verse 5. It says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Paul is teaching the Thessalonians that when they brought the gospel and separated, subsequent salvation to the Thessalonians, it was brought by word and by power. Now, there is a quote by Bruce R. McConkie, where he kind of elaborates on this verse a little bit. And I want to read that quote because it really opened my eyes to how important this verse is. So this is what Bruce R. McConkie says. It says, the true gospel consists of two things, the word and the power. Anyone can have the word. The books in which it is written are universally available, but the power must come from God. It is and must be dispensed according to his mind and his will to those who abide the law entitling them to receive it. The word of the gospel is the spoken or written account of what men must do to be saved. But actual salvation comes only when the power of God is received and used, and this power is the power of the priesthood, and the power of the Holy Ghost. Power of the priesthood and the power of the Holy Ghost. These must operate in the lives of men. Otherwise, their souls cannot be cleansed. They cannot be born again. They cannot become new creatures of the Holy Ghost. They cannot put off the natural man and become saints. They cannot be sanctified by the Spirit. So in order for us to really receive the gospel and the salvation that comes with the gospel, We need both of these parts, the word and the power. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about what role each part plays, because I feel like it can help us understand better what is being offered to us and also kind of what our responsibility is. Now, when I think about the relationship between the word and the power, it reminds me of the relationship between works and faith when it comes to salvation. So, We believe that as we work to become like Jesus Christ, we start to experience salvation on a bigger scale, right? When you are choosing to act like Jesus Christ and not only act like Jesus Christ, but when you're truly trying to become like Jesus Christ, to change your thoughts, to change your feelings, to become like him, you naturally start to experience the kind of life that Christ lived, right? You experience peace and joy and all the things that come with being like Christ, And in my mind, that's exactly what salvation is. Okay, salvation is when we experience the same kind of life that Christ experiences. We experience heaven, right? That's salvation. But no matter how good we mimic Christ or how perfect we are able to become, even if we are able to become perfect, it wouldn't matter. We would not be able to be actually saved. There had to be a power given to us, and in this case, we're talking about the atonement of Jesus Christ. There had to be a power from heaven to come in and take care of specific things that we did not, that we could not innately take care of ourselves. We needed Christ's atonement to take care of past sins. Otherwise, we would never be able to return to the presence of our Heavenly Father and stand before him. We would not be able to withstand his glory. And this reminds me of that relationship between the word and the power. Now, we work to take advantage of the word. The word is the written word of God, right, in the scriptures. 
and with the modern prophets. We read the word of God and it gives us instructions on how on how to mimic the Savior, on how to follow the Savior. Joseph Smith said that man can't be saved any faster than he gains knowledge, right? The more we gain knowledge and act on that knowledge, the more we are living the same kind of life that the Savior lived. We are experiencing the feelings that the Savior experienced. And in my mind, that is a good portion of what salvation is, right? There's other portions of salvation, but the extent that we can receive salvation here on earth, <laughs> that is how we receive it. But when I say gaining a knowledge of the word, and when Joseph Smith said, a man is saved no faster than he gains knowledge, I believe that it's more than just a recitation of facts, right? Instead, it is understanding something and knowing something so well that you alter your behavior according to that knowledge. So for example, I'm pretty sure that I will be alive tomorrow. 99% <laughs> sure I'm going to be alive tomorrow. And so I have a load of laundry down in the washer because I need clean clothes. I have chicken thawing in the freezer so I have something to cook for dinner tomorrow, <laughs> right? I know something, I believe something, and so I have altered my behavior to that knowledge. It is the same on a bigger scale when it comes to the gospel. When we fill our lives with charity, when we are selfless and we choose to love other people, we naturally start to become happier. We find more happiness in serving other people. When we choose to live a life of integrity, we find peace, right? We find peace with who we are. No matter what's going on around us, we can feel peace when we're living this life of integrity. And as we are acting on this knowledge, we are feeling the natural consequences of these actions, and we are experiencing heaven in a greater degree. We are receiving salvation to a greater degree. The word, according to Paul, is one of the parts that brings salvation, and that is how it brings salvation. It gives us the instructions on how to live like Christ, on how to live happy in the truest sense of the word. Now, there is a second part to the gospel, and that is the power. And Bruce R. McConkie actually split that power, so we have the word and we have the power. He split the power into two different things as well which he split it into the priesthood and the power of the Holy Ghost. Power of the priesthood, power of the Holy Ghost. This second part of the gospel, this power, was something that had to be bestowed. It was not something that we innately carried with us. We do not have that power within us to bring this portion of the gospel. It doesn't matter that, the Christ, that Christ performed the atonement if we are not able to bind ourselves to him in a way, in a covenant relationship that allows him to step in and pay for our sins. Bruce R. McConkie said that this power was the priesthood and the Holy Ghost. Let's talk about both. The first one, the priesthood. The priesthood power is not something that innately belongs to men. It is something that was given to man. When I think of the priesthood, one of the aspects that I think of the priesthood is that it is legally binding beyond death. So, for example, when Connor and I were dating, I could have gone to him and been like, I promise to be your wife. And then we could have tried acting as husband and wife and all that entails. But until I was legally married by authority, the authority given by a government... I would have not been able to enjoy all the legal benefits that come with being married. There is a power that governs heaven, right? And Heavenly Father gave us this power so that we could be bound to our Savior legally, right, beyond the grave. We can't seal things beyond the grave. Only God can do that. And he gave us a portion of his power so that we could bind ourselves to Christ so Christ could take care of our sins, right? So we could take advantage of the gospel so that we could be saved. The second part of this power is the Holy Ghost. 
Now, I remember reading a lot of verses about how we are sanctified by the Spirit. And the word sanctified is just another word for salvation. It means being freed from sin, right? It means being freed from the effects of sin, being freed from sin. So we've read verses about how we can be sanctified and cleansed by the Holy Ghost. And sometimes this confused me because I was like, we're cleansed by the atonement, but we're cleansed by the Spirit. What's kind of happening here? I do not completely understand this mechanism. I don't know if anyone completely understands this mechanism. Maybe the prophets and apostles or some other really, really righteous people. I do not personally understand the mechanism. However, I believe <laughs> that there are two ways that the power of the Holy Ghost is able to help deliver the gospel. The first one is that somehow the Holy Ghost delivers the effects of the atonement to the individual. Christ performed the atonement so that sin could be forgiven, but somehow it is in the act of taking the companionship of the Holy Ghost or when the Spirit can come upon us and sanctify and cleanse us, it's like the Spirit delivers that power of the atonement. The second way that I see that the Holy Ghost can sanctify us, can free us from sin, can help with this idea of the gospel and salvation, is that the Spirit can deliver gifts from our Heavenly Father that can help us overcome the natural man. So when we are struggling with temptation, we can pray for strength. Or when we have a work we need to accomplish, a mountain to climb, we can ask for these gifts to help us overcome our frailties to become more like our Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as I have made my way through these concepts, I feel like I've used a lot of big like buzzwords, like salvation, sanctified, all of these big words. And so I worry that it is difficult to be digested to the extent that I want it to be. And so I want to summarize it just a little bit. So Paul taught that the gospel comes through the word and the power. So we have this big topic, right? We want the gospel because the gospel brings us salvation. It saves us. It brings us happiness. That's what I believe salvation really is, is this happiness in the truest sense of the word. And it is delivered by word and by power. So we have first the word as we, the way that the word helps deliver salvation and helps deliver the gospel is it teaches us and gives us the instructions on how to live like the savior. And the more we live like the savior, the more we naturally experience the consequences of living like him, right? Good consequences, peace, happiness, joy. The more we experience the kind of life that he's experiencing, heaven, salvation, all of these things. The second thing that Paul talked about was the power. And the power was simply a gift that was given to us, right? And it was an absolutely essential part of delivering this gospel to us. It was bestowed through the priesthood power that comes in and binds us to our Savior so that he can pay for our sins. And it also comes in the form of the Holy Ghost that comes in and by some mechanism that I don't understand, cleanses us through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Now, we often say that we are part of the restored church of Jesus Christ, right? What does this really mean? In my mind, I'm sure it means a million different things to different people at different times. But as a general definition, I think a good definition is going off of what Paul said, right? We believe that a knowledge of God, that a true knowledge of God has been restored the word in its fullness has been restored. We also believe that the power necessary to really deliver that gospel so that it takes any kind of effect in our lives at all, we believe that that has been restored. That Heavenly Father had to take it away from the earth for a time because people were using it wrong, but he has restored it. Now, I believe this very sincerely. I believe that a knowledge of our Heavenly Father, that His Word has been restored, and I believe that His power has been restored to the earth. I also have some other beliefs. I believe that our Savior Jesus Christ 
blesses all of us to the very extent that we are willing to come unto him. And that can look like a lot of things. Just as one example, it looks like the atheist who is learning that serving is truly the happiest way to live your life, right? Even though this atheist doesn't have a belief in Christ, this atheist is still learning Christ-like principles, right? Even though he's not attributing it to Christ yet, he is still gaining a knowledge of an important Christ-like principle. And the Savior will bless him to the extent that he allows the Savior to bless him. I believe that the Savior is overjoyed by any promise made to him and any baptism performed, even if it has not yet been done by priesthood authority, that the Savior looks at that and he sees people wanting to come unto him. And I believe that he blesses them for it and is overjoyed that they want to take steps towards him. I believe that he blesses those of us who are part of the restored church who are still kind of ambling along and not taking full advantage of the fact that a true knowledge of our Heavenly Father and his power has been restored to the earth. That he is blessing us to the very extent that we are ambling along, right? There is no reason to discredit any step of goodness towards our Heavenly Father, whether through the lens of the Word or through the lens of the power that comes from Him, right? Any step that we take towards the Savior is going to be celebrated by the Savior. To me, this means that I can look around in a world that often seems really, really scary, in a world that often brings a lot of worries, <laughs> I can look around and remember that he is working with all of the individuals around me. Even if they are not directly taking the missionary discussions, the Savior is working to convert them, whether that's through sending the Holy Ghost to the extent that he can send the Holy Ghost, whether he is teaching them principles of the gospel, even if they don't know who he is yet. I am so grateful for a savior who has restored his church upon the earth. I'm also grateful that he chooses to bless everybody in not of church because the world would be really terrifying if he only blessed people who were part of the church. I am grateful that he chooses to push me to work to become like him because I know the blessings that come with his soul stretching methods. I know that because he allows me to work and struggle and stretch, not only am I becoming more like him in the sense that I'm acting more like him, but also within that stretching and that struggle, there's growth right in there as well. And I am grateful for the power that he sends to this earth that we did not have. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.